Hello. I am Professor Doug, and I want to welcome you to the short videos I have prepared for my philosophy students. I am using a software program that lets me create avatars who carry on conversations that I hope will help you understand some key points that I wish to make. Of course, in person I do not look at all like my avatar, and what you hear with the computer-generated voices may not always be exactly what I intended. However, I do think these animated videos are still more interesting than what I might present if I actually talked into a camera. For one thing, I am forced to be far more brief than I would be in person. Two of the videos introduce you to some of the terms we use in describing the way we put ideas together when we want to make an effective case. They are a very basic introduction to this thing we call logic. Please check them out. Professor Doug, I want to know more about logic as a tool for making an effective case for something. Ah, then you need to understand the difference between formal or deductive reasoning and informal or inductive reasoning. I think of this as the difference between wearing a tuxedo and just going about in shirt sleeves. Formal reasoning is very limited in its applications, although it is the standard for what we do with mathematics. I never thought of a math problem like wearing a tuxedo. Why do you say that? When you want to think in a very formal manner you present statements that allow no exceptions and then you have another statement that recombines the information. In your high school geometry, for instance, you always started with statements that were either true because of initial definitions or assumptions are true because they had already been proven. Your reasons step by step from what was given as true we call these your premises and arrived at what now had to follow we call this your conclusion. Do you mean I cannot use formal reasoning in real life? No, you most certainly can, as when you cite rules or principles as your premises. For example, let's start with the idea that only students properly enrolled in a course may receive a passing grade and then add the fact that your friend joe has officially dropped the course and so is no longer enrolled what more can you now be sure of i would have to say that joe will not get a passing grade exactly now in real life it is difficult to make statements that do not allow for exceptions most of the time we reason on the basis of similarities of one kind or another. We may know a lot about past situations, for instance, so we predict the future based on these similarities. This is where statistics comes into play. We call this inductive rather than deductive reasoning. Wait a minute. Statistics is a branch of math, and you just said that math had us use for more deductive reasoning. Yes indeed. Statistics is a definite exception, however. Here we talk about probabilities rather than absolute certainty. Now for practical purposes that is often the best we can do. I can calculate the odds for or against something taking place that part itself is deductive, of course but I must always allow for the possibility, no matter how slight, that any actual event beats the odds. I understand. But outside of statistics when do I use inductive reasoning? Almost all the time when you need to show someone that you have a good case. Remember, we are not talking about how our minds actually work but about how we attempt to present an informed judgment. We can be making a prediction about the future or we can be trying to explain something that has happened in the past. It is what a lawyer does in front of a jury. A judge must use deductive reasoning in applying legal principles at a trial, but lawyers and juries have to reason inductively. In a criminal case the evidence should support the verdict beyond a reasonable doubt and in a civil suit we expect a verdict to be based on which side appears to have a stronger case. In my other classes I learn about scientific reasoning. Is that deductive or inductive? Actually it is a bit of both. We imagine how we might explain something, usually on the basis of similarities or analogies, and then we systematically try to prove ourselves wrong through our experiments. Technically, we begin with a hypothesis that there might not be a difference when we insert or remove a variable and then see what happens. If there is a difference, then we have disproved that original hypothesis, 
and if we can keep doing this we feel we may be getting closer to the right explanation. So the original hypothesis involves inductive reasoning and the way I attempt to prove it wrong is deductive? Correct. Now for either deductive or inductive reasoning the real trick is watch out for mistakes in how we apply these ideas. But that is something for another conversation when we can talk about both formal and informal fallacies. Professor Doug, you said you would tell me more about something you call logical fallacies. Yes indeed. You remember how we talked about the difference between formal and informal reasoning? I do. You told me that formal reasoning was deductive while informal reasoning was inductive. If I applied deductive reasoning correctly true premises guaranteed me a true conclusion, but I am not sure why. That is because formal reasoning is all about the pattern or organization of the ideas we work with. Because we concentrate on the pattern instead of the content of these ideas we typically work with letters or other symbols instead of the actual words. The main types of deductive logic you study in school will either be what we call syllogisms dating back to ancient Greeks or the propositional logic developed at the turn of the 20th century. Formal fallacies are mistakes we make in working with these patterns. Would you give me some examples? Yes. If I say all fruits are nutritious and apples are fruit, what would follow? That's easy. Apples are nutritious. Correct. It would be a contradiction to classify apples as fruit and then say they are not nutritious. Now what if I said all Republicans are conservative and then that the senators from Idaho are conservative? I guess it would follow they must be Republicans. Sorry, this is incorrect. You see, it may well be true in itself, but there is still the possibility that we have conservative senators who are Democrats or independents. That is why this second pattern is an example of a mistake or fallacy. We even have a name for it, but I will not go into that now. Oh, maybe formal logic is not that easy after all. I would have to learn more about how to test to see if we are using the right pattern. Exactly. Now that was an example of a formal fallacy. With informal fallacies we look at things differently. Since here we are working with facts of one sort or another we need to know that the information we start with is actually relevant to what we intend to prove and also that it sufficiently rules out alternate interpretations. Again, may I have some examples? Yes. One of the most common informal fallacies occurs when we say that something must be a good product because a famous celebrity has endorsed it. Another is to say I must be right because you cannot prove me wrong. Actually we could list about a dozen or so types of things that might be mistakes in our reasoning. What is tricky, of course, is that the line between something acceptable and something fallacious may not always be that clear. As a result students often get carried away and see everything as a fallacy. So again I would need to take a lot more time to get a feeling for when something works and when it doesn't. I am afraid so. A quick rule for both formal and informal reasoning is to think in terms of counterexamples. See if you can tell a story with the same information in the premises but add something more so that we have an opposite conclusion. That is what I did in talking about Republicans and Conservatives. If it even makes sense, you know that you do not have a good deductive pattern. If it makes sense but would be highly unlikely then you might still have a case that is what we call inductively strong. So just because an argument fails the test for deductive reasoning does not mean it is a bad case? Yes. A deductive argument might be valid, meaning that the pattern is okay if it is valid and the premises are true we call it a sound argument. An inductive argument by definition is never valid but it can be either strong or weak. If it is strong and again the premises are true we call it cogent. But that should be enough for now.